Welcome to SpacePod. We find ourselves in volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous times, and the world of workspace is right in the middle of this. So SpacePod pulls together professionals with a personal point of view, and we settle down for a short yet hopefully interesting chat. Let's get started. Here we go with episode five of SpacePod. Myself and my colleague from IBM, Paul Gatland, or Paul G, are restlessly searching for great thought leaders to give their personal perspective on space. There's no official commitment to strategy on anyone's behalf. So it is a great pleasure that we have today Sharon Richardson, the founder of the intriguingly called Joining Dots. Welcome, Sharon, and please tell us your story. Thanks, Paul. I founded Joining Dots back in 2006 after just over a decade in the IT industry, including a spell at Microsoft, because I felt that we were continually seeing advances in information technology, but not enough focus on how it fits within a social system. So the name Joining Dots was just that, connecting people, information and technology to create better outcomes. And I'm now just finishing a PhD in spatial data science, looking at if we can use mobile data to sense how context affects behavior, how our decisions and actions are connected to the environmental and social conditions we experience. Because for an AI to be used to create smart spaces, it needs to be context aware. And that's a lot easier said than done. This is really good. So I'm really curious about the context awareness comment. Is that I suppose in the smart building workspace world that we live in, ultimately the holy grail. For the first time, we can now see what impact urban activities have on our daily environment and in turn our health because we have a lot of sensors monitoring things like air pollution. There is already research being published claiming that the drop in urban air pollution could be saving thousands of lives. It is a possibility that the data will provide a demonstrable case for a shift towards cleaner energy and transportation and different working practices such as more remote working and demand responsive services that reduce congestion caused by having peak commuting times. Sharon, when we think about uh, you know, the post-COVID-19 world and how we're going to get back into the offices, airports and restaurants, you know, with the knowledge of space, so you know, who, what, how, where, when, and the interpretation of what will be real big data outputs, you know, what problems and opportunities can you foresee? Cool. Well, that's a difficult question to answer. Up until now, we've still been seeing, you know, IoT, Internet of Things projects, more commonly as experimental pilots rather than a strategic investment. It's quite possible that COVID-19 will drive organisations towards a fundamental rethink of how they use IT to benefit the business. It's created a massive increase in the use of cloud computing for online services, and I suspect the follow-on phase as we come out of lockdown will see a similar bump towards mobile and IoT services in physical settings. I think in the short term, assuming social distancing is still required, there is potential to use data to distribute demand for constrained spaces such as public transport and restaurants. But those who have very peaky demand, so say lots of demand at the weekends or in the early evening but quieter the rest of the time, well there's potential to distribute that demand, particularly if working patterns also become more flexible. I'm actually encouraging one of my master's students to look into this as a simulation. Yeah, so what about office space, Sharon? I sense you might see a change in the role of the office as we know it. If more remote work becomes established as part of business as usual, then office space will require a fundamental rethink from redesigning interiors to reimagining what is an office. People desire social contact, that the work environment actually moves closer to home, that we have shared spaces, not with colleagues, but simply with other people in the same neighbourhood where we live. And that could mean fewer visits to a company office for when direct interactions with colleagues is needed, which may not be a daily requirement. You know, that could have really interesting consequences for the desirability to live in cities. I especially like your comments about the video software and the drain on attention and concentration levels. You know, both Paul and I often uh, sense the, uh, uh, the consequences of working from home too much. You can't simply put everyone in front of a webcam and replace a physical meeting environment. Communication actually becomes harder. You know, we pick up a lot of subtle clues like shifts in body language when we're in physical proximity that aren't detectable when you're staring at a portrait photo of someone. You know, perhaps sensors could help with that and be incorporated into the software interface. You know, also, because you're literally staring at each other's faces, you're forced into a more constant attentive state, which is very tiring compared with the more typical partial attentive state we normally have during group face-to-face -face meetings. As you're talking, Sharon, mention the complexity of the human being and the way AI, big data, 
all coming together to try and help, I pulled down a book that is in my top read list, Dr. Hannah Fry's Hello World. And I think you had a small part in this great no-nonsense discussion about all things human, AI and data. True or false? Obviously, I'm biased, but I would recommend anyone interested in how humans and computers can make flawed decisions, both alone and working together, read the book. There are so many great examples in there to learn from. But I think relevant to what we've been talking about today is how bad decisions occur at the extremes. When a situation is extremely rare or has never been experienced before, which is what we're experiencing right now with COVID-19 pandemic, and when a situation is more common than we realise, which is true of many everyday decisions. I think there's an example in Hannah's book of a tragic air crash, you know, the, the way the pilot interacted with the machine, uh, in this case, the airliner. Planes often fly on autopilot for extended times, particularly during mid-flight. An Air France flight had an unexpected sensor failure and handed over control to an inexperienced co-pilot who was on duty whilst the captain and other co-pilot rested. The pilot had accumulated plenty of hours in flight simulators but had little flight experience. The plane hit some turbulence and the co-pilot overreacted, putting the plane into a steep climb to pull out of it. The plane went so high, air could no longer flow over the wings and it stalled, going into a free fall, but with its nose up. Alarms sounded in the cockpit and alerted the other pilots. There was still time to rescue the flight by pushing the stick forward and pushing the nose down to allow the air back over the wings and for it to then arc back up and level out. But the inexperienced co-pilot kept his stick pulled back because he was thinking he was trying to pull out of a nose down dive because that's the scenario that you rehearse in a flight simulator because that's how most dives happen. The, the plane goes down with its nose down. This was a fall with its nose up. By the time the captain realised the mistake and ordered them to drop the nose, it was too late. What, what was interesting, I also read that uh, I think there was a recommendation after that crash that, uh, uh, that the pilots were trained more from recovery from unusual attitudes. So yeah, I think there's always some good comes out of it, but obviously at a, at a huge expense. There's some examples uh, in the book. So thanks for sharing. I know, and I know Paul G could talk about flying planes for hours, but sadly, time is ticking. So this has been a great discussion and perspective from you, Sharon, it's gold dust. Right, that's it. I think we've all stayed our, overstayed our welcome. A big thanks to you, Sharon, for your insight and passion. Good luck with joining Dots. And to you, Paul G, thank you, sir. You have been listening to SpacePod, and if you like it, tell others. Please stay safe. <laughs>